Don said that I'm from Bangor. It's easier to tell people when you travel abroad that you're just from nowhere, Oklahoma. Um, and any of y'all know where that's at? I know you know where that's at. It's now here. Yeah. Um, so anyways, everybody always likes to hear that. But um, I do want to talk to y'all today about um, the uh, saga that we've been through. And I'm going to apologize in advance for this wheel because I'm going to screw this thing up the whole through the, throughout the presentation. So um, we have been through a, a saga since I began as Extension Weed Specialist um, at the University of Arkansas. And I, I always like to start out the talk, Don mentioned um, going to some other states um, and I always ask them, y'all remember the good old days? You know, back in the good old days of weed control, it was a hoe typically. And this is cotton um, in Arkansas and, and any weed scientist will tell you the reason they became a weed scientist because your daddy made you hoe. So I didn't have to hoe when I was a kid. That's a, that's the common story. The only problem is if I can do this one, that's 2011 in Arkansas. That is not the good old days. That is today. We are approximately 52% of our acres hand weeded at a cost of like 30 to $150 an acre, depending on how bad it is and just how long it takes them to go through it, depending on whether you can find a hoe crew. Um, I knew I had reached a new high and a pinnacle in my career when I started getting phone calls. And one of the number one questions I was getting was, where can I get a good hoe? <laughs> And as a weed scientist, that's sort of like admitting defeat, right? Um, the reason they were calling for that is because those Walmart and Home Depot hoes were breaking on these great old big pigweeds when they were trying to chop them. And in fact, I did some research and found out where they could get a good hoe because I'm a good weed scientist and I answer my calls when I get them. Um, but that's not where we want to be weed science wise. In 1999, when I was a tech service rep, I was working for American Simon. We had ALS resistant um, pigweed. That's Scepter Classic um, in wheat. Y'all recognize that classic chemistry maybe here is Glean, Finesse. Those are all ALS chemistries. Well, they had pretty much quit working for us on pigweed and cucklebur. And Roundup came along and man, we, it, it really saved the day. We, we were struggling at that time. Um, from 99 to 2002, Roundup Ready was really thoroughly adopted throughout Arkansas. 95% uh, of our 3.3 million acres of beans, which is not that much if you look at it compared to other states, but for us, it's a big percentage of our acres. 95% were Roundup Ready. About a million acres of cotton at that time was Roundup Ready, and some of the corn was still conventional, but it was all becoming Roundup Ready very rapidly. So all in all, we were around about 5 million acres of Roundup Ready crops and everything was fine. It was amazing to drive through the Delta of Arkansas and see field after field after field that was soybeans and dirt, corn and dirt, cotton and dirt. It had never been that clean before. And then about 2002, I became extension weed specialist. And I think at that point, everything started going downhill. <laughs> um, this is a, a picture that was taken in Northeast Arkansas when I first started. Um, one of the guys that was already there, some of y'all know, Dr. Ken Smith was already working on this um, when I started. Um, but this is a field of soybeans that had had a burn down application, full rate of glyphosate. And when I say the horseweed were becoming resistant, I don't mean they could tolerate it. I don't mean some of them were just not dying that good. I mean, dead versus alive. So we were seeing full-blown resistance to this weed, um, horseweed. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you know, um, this is our first case again in 2003 in Northeast Arkansas. It's a composite. It's mainly, you know, only a problem in no-till. We didn't have it that much. It was in ditches and turn rows and roadsides and things like that. Um, but when it became tolerant to glyphosate, it found a niche um, in our cropping systems. And this is a map of Arkansas. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is the Mississippi River, runs right through here. This is West Tennessee over here. Now West Tennessee had glyphosate resistant horseweed before we did. 
So I think it's suspicious that our first two counties were so near West Tennessee, I'm just saying. Um, this should have been Arkansas, but someone in Missouri didn't want to be from Arkansas. That's the Missouri Boot Hill. They had it too at that time. Um, as we kind of advance this map a little bit, I want to show you a little more about this weed, horseweed. If you zoom in closely on this um, and look, I don't know how y'all's eyesight is from there, but this is the seed and this is like a little parachute. You ever seen a cottonwood tree in Oklahoma when the wind hits it about 30 miles an hour and then the white just goes and goes and goes? That's what horseweed does, okay? That's how its weed is disseminated. So keep that in mind as I show you this next series of slides. Remember 03? In 2004, we took a survey. It had moved out of these two counties into the surrounding counties, 05, and finally by 2006. It had infested just about every agricultural county in Arkansas. So just a little geography on Arkansas so you understand what we're talking about. There's a little bit of ag in this county. The Arkansas River Valley runs up through here. There's vegetables and some row crop here. Fayetteville, our ag school, is located way up here. This is the ag. This is the ag school, just, just so you know. But you can see that uh, how quickly this weed spread with that seed mechanism that it had. I mean, it just took over in a matter of about four years. We went from zero dicamba use in Arkansas, nobody even knew what clarity or dicamba was, to about two million acres worth in four years. Um, because it turned out it was the best thing we could do in burn down. We used it on just about every cotton and soybean acre out there and this one weed in an instance added $10 an acre to our weed control cost. So we had to think about plant back intervals. You know, we still had some other weeds in Roundup Ready that we were having to address. Uh, we learned about a herbicide called First Rate that we had never used ever before in Arkansas, but guess what? We found out it would kill horseweed. It became a tank mix partner with Roundup, and overnight we started using dicamba and some First Rate. Um, and things started to change about 2005, 2006 for us. But we found an answer. We just added something to it, and we were able to pretty much just keep farming. I mean, we didn't really have to change our way of thinking too much. We were still five million acres and growing um, in Roundup Ready crops at that time. So that weed wasn't enough to convince us to really do anything different. Um, it continues to be a problem for us today. Um, one of the reasons is, just like in Oklahoma, I'm sure we have absentee landowners. We have ground that goes unrented at times, things like that. Got a real clean field right over here right across the road, a field that somebody has obviously abandoned. It's already turning white. You can see the seed if you look in there. That one field will reinfest the whole county. So every effort that you've made to try to clean up this weed, it's going to get blown around. This is southern Lone Oak County where I'm at. I'm going to get calls from them next year. I can just tell you in advance. When I saw this field, I was like, oh no, here we go. So once we got it, you know, it, it's really hard to get rid of. In 2003 and 2005, we continued to find more glyphosate resistant weeds. Um, it sort of became my career there for a while to go out and start doing screening and, and seeing what we could come up with. Um, one year we found glyphosate resistant common ragweed. Next year, giant ragweed. Both of these are problems now in the Midwest. Um, these are minor problems for us in Arkansas because of their biology. Um, they don't really affect our, our full season cropping systems. Um, but we did discover them and we did add them to the list. Um, I may have took the slide out, but you know, again, my approach, Don, was to just go in and say, well, what can I add to round up to the tank to try to take care of this problem? because we didn't really want to change what we were doing. We just wanted this one weed to go away. So we come up with tank mix partners and, and we, we resolve the problem. So we're still, we're still doing pretty good, um, you know, through 2005 and six. We're still five million acres of Roundup Ready. We're still rocking along. 
Um, this is what a distribution map looked like of glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth or pigweed. Um, Palmer has been described as the king of the pigweeds. It's the toughest one. I tell everybody that in Arkansas it ate all the other pigweeds and it's the only pigweed left. Um, it's characterized by a long petiole on the leaf, high reproductive capacity. It has the ability to germinate and make seed in just a short time or it can get really tall and make seed. But in 05 we didn't care. Um, we were killing it um, and not having any problems at all. Everything changed in the fall of 2005. I got called out to a field again in northeast Arkansas near Tennessee, near the Mississippi River. Um, in fact, that tree line in the background, if you went over that, you would be in the Mississippi River. We were on the other side of the levee um, where it floods a lot. This farmer called and said, I got this big patch of pigweeds left in my, uh, in my field that didn't die. You guys might want to come take a look at it. We'd already heard about pigweed in Georgia and North Carolina at this time, but we didn't have it in Arkansas. So we come out and we sampled this field. And I don't know if you noticed or not, there's something different right there. That's a giant ragweed. So when we came out there, we already found one of the other ones that we knew we had. Um, so we actually had two. Ran a little screening in the greenhouse and everything changed for us in 2006. Um, that 22 doesn't stand for the 22nd sample we screen. It stands for 22 ounces of Roundup Weathermax. And uh, that's what was putting over it. This was a, a research population that we had from another site and we sprayed those trays side by side and obviously um, it didn't take a PhD from Mississippi State to know there was something different about those two populations. So we got interested in pigweed um, really in 2006. And again, I mean, what an amazing weed. Uh, I'm six foot four. See how tall that one is that I'm standing by. Um, that's a full season pigweed. We've observed these things to come up in the spring, have the weather turn off cold, and guess what? They go reproductive when they're the size of this bottle of water and put on seed. Very responsive to the environment. Um, up to 1.8 million seed per plant. We had a graduate student. He didn't count them. He weighed them. He counted some and then he weighed the rest of them. But up to 1.8 million seeds in a single plant. All right. Are pigweeds male or female? Yes, is the answer. They're both male and female. They're imperfectly monoecious or dioecious, however you want to look at it. Actually, pigweed, in response to the environment, will decide whether to be male or female. If they are in a good area and everything is fine and conditions are right and nothing is harming them or whatever, they'll become female and they'll drop their seed right there. If they're under some sort of stress, environmental or otherwise, they tend to become male plants to produce pollen, to take their genes elsewhere. So it's a highly weedy characteristic to have in a plant if you're looking for the perfect plant. And what we observed, and I think I have a picture here in a second, is that early on when we were spraying glyphosate, more of the plants would be male when we would go out and look at the fields following applications, the survivors would be male. And it's because the glyphosate was putting stress on them and for whatever reason they were becoming more male plants. But they were making pollen and they were making a few seed because I said they were imperfectly male or female. Hybridization, pigweed have no morals, no ethics whatsoever. They will hybridize with multiple partners and you get all kinds of gene flow in a pigweed population. So it's really an amazing weed and you can understand how quickly some of the things happen. Looking back in 05, we knew it was out there. Other states had it, but we weren't overrun. Looking back, this is what we saw. All of those pristine, clean fields we had when I started, you know, we were starting to see these pigweed plants out in there. Just one here and there, little patch. A corner, well, we just missed it, or a streak, you know, and you're like, well, that's just, the sprayer didn't overlap or something, you know. 
we're making excuses. We wanted to keep farming the way we were. Didn't want to do any changes. So in 06, we confirmed that one population again in Mississippi County, um, up there in, in northeastern part of the state. In 2007, we had a graduate student go out. We said, well, we found one. I wonder what else is out there. Okay, so what happened was is we got with our county agent staff and we're still very well staffed with county agents in Arkansas. We got at least one ag agent in every county. And those ag agents went out and they went ahead of the combine before the guy harvested the field and they looked for survivors in Roundup Ready fields and they sampled them. And they did about 300 altogether samples, this one graduate student did. And when he tested them, the reds were resistant to a field rate, the yellows were resistant to half a field rate, and the greens were still susceptible. They just survived somehow. So in 07, we said, well, we have a little worse problem than we thought we did. And that was some of those individual survivors, see, but they weren't eating up the fields and they weren't causing economic loss yet. They were just out there, here and there. By 2008, reports were coming in everywhere. Um, we had confirmation of field resistant glyphosate resistance in all these counties and currently it's basically everywhere. There isn't any susceptible pigweed left and this was one of the most, this was more rapid and exploded in a different way than the uh, horseweed previously did and, and it was amazing. You may be wondering how in the world it jumped over these counties. Remember I said the University of Arkansas is in Washington County, so we got to do research on this stuff, right? So we moved it up there. <coughs> these guys didn't appreciate it, but um, this is that river valley. It moved up into the river valley. Um, it didn't take a prevailing wind because we were moving it in equipment, seed, trucks, mud on your boots whatever it's got a really tiny seed and, and we just have massive seed distribution so be aware this is what we saw and we kind of ignored it we just sort of let it go and uh, didn't want to keep doing it this is that survivor I was talking about um, full rate of glyphosate Don mentioned y'all may be where we were a few years ago and this is what I've been telling guys in the Midwest that have are thinking they're starting to have this problem this is not a normal looking pigweed. For those of you that aren't a weed scientist, this is a very strange looking pigweed because it has lost its apical dominance. It's kind of like a cotton plant. It should have one stalk growing up with branches coming off, but what's happened, and you can see it right in there, the main stem has been burned off, but then it's branched back out and come out because it's got resistance um, to glyphosate. So this is what the early resistance looked like. Now we spray it and it has zero effect on the pigweed whatsoever. But early on, when we didn't know what we were dealing with exactly, and likely this plant would become a male in that scenario. So, you know, if you guys are where we were in 05, and you, this is something to be aware of, that may not just be a miss, that may not just be one that didn't get good coverage or whatever, it may be resistant. It only takes a field one to two years to go from this, looking like this to being a total loss. And this was a farm that we got called out to in 2009, around 2009-2010. The guy um, had had streaks in his field the year before um, that he thought were applicator streaks. He thought he missed it. And he went out and he just ran his combine through it. And, and came back in and um, we actually talked to this guy. We, we talked to the farmer prior to this year. And, and at that time, some new technology called Liberty Link was coming out. And we said, you know, you really need to put this field in Liberty Link beans and uh, use a pre-emerge down. Well, <clears throat> in the meantime, he talked to his seed guy. He talked to his chemical guy, his consultant. It's going to be a hassle to have these Liberty Link beans. We just really want to stay in Roundup Ready. We'll fix it. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll fix it. Well, he planted. He came back in. He sprayed his first shot of Roundup. It didn't kill anything. 
and then he was it was we have learned since then that it's when they get this big it's it's too far gone this has been our biggest culprit for spreading pigweed seed okay that's how that field went from being just one or two or having some streaks in it to being completely infested is we feel like it's moved through harvest equipment guys sharing combines each other's fields so you go from having no problem to the combine combines a field with resistant pigweed they move to the next field that doesn't have it and you went from no problem to 100 percent problem in just one year because you seeded it um, and there's no way to clean a combine out um, when it comes to these things 2009 and 2010 was the season of the pigweed harvest this is that same farmer we went and looked at where he gave up um, he felt like he was doing more damage to his combine um, than he was as harvesting 10 bushels of beans or whatever he was getting out of this mess okay so he just quit and I took a picture of it he had $230 an acre invested in this right here at the time I took this picture $78 worth of that I think was in herbicides that's $78 herbicide program Greg right there so yeah he called us and said I gotta do something different I gotta do something different so we went out on this farm and we took over he said we'll do whatever you say and we said well can we beat it you know can we is there anything we can do to beat this guy we said we're gonna do extend we're gonna turn this into an extension demonstration site I don't show this to brag but when you know what you're dealing with and you accept what you have and you plan for it <laughs> we've made a tremendous difference just from one year to the next so we felt like we had a story to tell we had programs to talk about we still had some tools um, we had a lot of pushback from the industry industry doesn't like change and especially if it means they're not going to use your seed anymore they're going to use somebody else's seed or chemical or whatever but this is a product called prefix which is dual and flex star or formesfin followed by liberty in liberty link beans and we drilled the beans instead of rowing the beans um, a little agronomy there to try to get faster canopy closure um, but we were successful this one year alone in 2010 um, right over here from where this picture's taken left of there was full of plots just hundreds of plots that we put out uh, myself and, and Ken Smith was my fellow extension weed scientist um, I can't emphasize enough how fortunate we were to have a full weed science staff when this happened um, Ken had two technicians I had three we had two extension weed scientists downstate to work on this problem if it hadn't been for Ken I'm not sure he's moved on to another job in Texas now with Kimmy Nova but if, I, if it hadn't been the two of us working together I'm not sure we could have pulled off all this what we did but we had over 500 visitors to this site okay and getting somebody here Charles was about like getting them to nowhere okay this was nowhere Arkansas but we had we including three or four Greyhound bus loads from uh, from people out of state so we had a tremendous amount of interest we decided to have a meeting um, and I think we were having a beer under over here by this little white building after one of our field days and we said you know we got a lot of really good information and uh, we need to we maybe ought to have a meeting and kind of get this out because it's becoming a really big problem we were getting calls from growers that were running combines through these fields right and left it was bad I mean it was bad and uh, we said let's you know we we started brainstorming and smart me I said Ken said well let's have a symposium and let's bring people in from out of state and we'll have everybody we can get here and we'll try to get the word out that this is for real and, and tell our story and I said well if we're going to have a symposium it's going to be in Arkansas who are the Razorbacks and it's going to be about pigweed let's call it the pig posium kind of catchy right so we decided to have this little meeting called the pig posium we invited about 400 people this area seated 500 the overflow area seated another 300 
we ended up having 800 people turn out for this meeting and we damn near ruined a perfectly good caterer. <laughs> that guy, he was about to lose it. Um, but people didn't care at this meeting whether they got fed or not. This was a, not a typical extension meeting where they come to get their free lunch or whatever and let's sit through your talk and you know, pay the price for some ribs. These men and women were, had, a, had a problem. and I mean, they wanted to be there. They came from seven different states. Seven states. We had a, one company that flew some guys from California over here for this meeting. And it was located not far from nowhere, Arkansas. <laughs> it just happened to be on I-40. So it was a little bit easier to get to. Um, it's the only time in my life I've talked to that many people. And I literally stood at the front with the lights coming on the stage and I could not see the back of the room. So, I mean, it was, a, it was an amazing meeting. But it, and it's not anything I had to say particularly. We had lots of speakers. Um, again, we had five weed scientists. We were all on the agenda. We all had different aspects of this thing that we talked about. Um, but it was just, it just sort of gave credence to the magnitude of this problem. We had people from Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri. I mean, you name it. We had all these folks there. So we averted our physical pigweed cliff. You said a pigweed apocalypse, right? We averted the apocalypse. At the time I made this slide, we were having a physical cliff in Washington. I think we fell off of it. I don't know. But, um, you know, we, we did avert it. Um, have we been 100% successful? I can't say that it's gone. We have not eradicated this weed, and I still have my detractors out there in the state that like to leave me messages. Um, I think it's a novel use of black tape that they did for those letters. Um, but uh, that's a morning glory, and this is a big circle where they sprayed Roundup around that sign, and that's a Palmer pigweed. So the guy that left that sign there knew what he was doing um, when he left it, um, and this was just this past year. So uh, it's an idea of what a real uh, a real apocalypse looks like, a real you know critical deal. Um, our key tools in the pigweed fight in soybeans, and I'm not going to bore y'all with a bunch of really detailed stuff about that doesn't apply to Oklahoma, um, but we've had to go back to residual herbicides. <clears throat> we've had to put a real emphasis on start and clean in these fields. We cannot have anything out there, any pigweeds when we plant. Um, we have to get rid of them. If you don't, if you don't get rid of them at planting time, Something looks like that right there at planting time and you plan into that, I can't help you. You've already messed up. Our tools post-emerge are Liberty and Flexstar. We have one conventional herbicide that will kill a pigweed if you spray it about right here. Okay? And I was going around to all these meetings and I was telling guys, you got to get that first shot out on a one to two, maybe three inch pigweed. And then I said, you know, I need a couple of slides to show them what that looks like. And I went out in the greenhouse and, and planted a tray of this pigweed seed and stuck a ruler in it and watered it. And I came back out the next morning, and guess what? They were inch tall. It was time to spray. <laughs> One day, 24 hours, they were an inch tall. Um, my coworker, Jason Norsworthy, does a lot of the weed biology work there at Fayetteville. He tells me, that these things will grow about an inch every two days. Okay? So we are in a culture where we got five million acres of Roundup Ready crops that we were able to go out and spray weeds about six inches tall <laughs> and clean up and have perfectly clean crops by the end of the year. Now we are in a culture where you got to spray here and you got about three days to do it, or four, because they're going to be where? The further don't matter if they get over three inches. We really can't. We really have a hard time killing a pigweed if it's over three inches tall. So this weed has completely changed the way we farm soybeans, cotton, mainly soybeans and cotton in Arkansas. 
But those are our tools and those are our training deals. Um, a lot of our guys, you know, as I was saying, if you kill them, they hadn't learned nothing. You don't learn nothing if you kill them. Some of them I just want to strangle because this is a, this could be a flex star field or a Liberty Link field. This pigweed is too big to spray. And we are having to really drill it through their, through their heads because they want the Liberty system to be like Roundup used to be. And so we find these fields that look pretty good from the road. All those big, tall, dead pigweeds out there. This is Liberty at 29 ounces over the top. You get out in there, look at the bottom of that plant. It's not dead. It's not working. So maybe you think the worst thing going on out here is he's going to have pigweeds in his beans, right? As a weed scientist 10 or 15 years ago, my train of thought would have been, that's the worst thing this guy's got going on out here. He's going to have pigweed in his beans, but that's not the worst thing that's going on. The worst thing that's going on, this is a terrible picture, but if you zoom in to a thick patch that they sprayed late, you see some dead ones. The Liberty killed that one. But green, green, green stalks coming back out. Those are survivors. Reckon they're more tolerant? They may not be resistant yet, but I guarantee you they're more tolerant. And there's a phrase for that called creeping resistance. And I'm not, we, lots of guys call it different things. But these pigweed, again, do they have morals? No. They're going to cross. And if this one's tolerant and this one's tolerant, the babies may be a little more tolerant, right? So I am really, really, really trying to get our guys to understand that we're going to do the exact same thing that we did with our ALS chemistry and then the exact same thing that we did with our Roundup chemistry. We're doing the exact same thing with our Liberty Link chemistry if we're not careful. So that's been one of my biggest messages. A little bit of data. These are, it's got Ignite in here, but they changed the name back to Liberty. We prefix followed by Ignite. MTZ, Authority MTZ followed by Ignite. Good pigweed control. It's got three modes of action against pigweed over here. First point I want to make. Two shots of Ignite, properly timed. I can do it with just Ignite alone or Liberty alone. Now the problem we run into here, this Ignite went out 10 days after planting. He sprayed that pigweed, that one inch pigweed or two inch pigweed like I'm talking about. This guy over here, he's trying to use Liberty like Roundup. And he waited 22 days after planting or after emergence. He lost about 20% pigweed control. So I try to tell our guys and I've one of my extension missions is that you cannot farm with Liberty the way we did with Roundup. Roundup is gone. It'll never be as easy as Roundup once was. We've had to go back, I had to go back, Dr. Carter, to agronomy, my agronomy days, okay? Um, we said we got all these guys trying to irrigate. We're 100% irrigated in Arkansas. Almost all, of, all our crops are irrigated, almost. Um, and a lot of the way they do that is row water. Okay, so we grow a lot of things on wide rows, 38 inch rows. And we started noticing we're seeing a lot more failures on these wide rows with our pigweed programs. And so we put in a study comparing 30 inch rows to a drill, drill beans on seven and a half inch rows. Um, and this is pigweed control at 120 days after that last ignite went out. And in this particular trial, we didn't get there with two shots of Ignite on 30 inch rows. We purposefully, we watered this field. We didn't irrigate it. We just gave it enough to kind of keep it going. So these, these row beans never really lapped the middles too good. Okay. But our drill beans did. Um, if you just look at a couple of the programs that actually failed, that only gave us 80% control, having the narrow row, versus the wide row was worth about 40% weed control. So we've had to fall back to some cultural practices and to some cultural recommendations for pigweed control and basic agronomy. 
And in this particular study, the only thing that worked was a full program of two shots of Ignite, a residual with two modes of action against pigweed, and we were still not quite at 100% control in drill beans. So it's a tough weed, and we've had to talk to a lot of guys about, about row spacing. This is Liberty Link. We could have put this same test out in Roundup Ready and changed the players down here and probably showed the same thing. Um, but we're a lot more limited not having Liberty in the pigweed fight if we try to grow Roundup Ready. But, but there are a lot of guys still growing Roundup Ready and, and making it work in this situation. Um, Larry Purcell is our soybean physiologist at Fayetteville. He took some images of what this canopy closure looks like and they found out that you need about 90% light interception to stop weed germination and that's a 38 inch row versus a 19 inch row um, taken at some date, I don't know, but this was 90 and this wasn't yet. So he just had a good picture illustrating um, what that canopy closure does and what it looks like, you know, looking up like you're laying under the under the canopy. Talking a lot about herbicide mode of action with our growers, we're making them understand. These are pages out of our MP44. Um, you know, and, and for those of you that don't necessarily know a lot about herbicide modes of action, this is a numbering system um, that either WSSA or HRAC one, I forget which one this is. Um, but these numbers represent a family of chemistry. I talked about ALS resistance, it's a number two. Canopy, scepter, finesse, if it was up here would be a number two, glean in wheat, okay? So when, when we first started having this problem, our farmers were going out, we had this new, fairly new product called Valor. Really good pigweed material pre. Works great, you guys used it in peanuts here some, I think. Um, then we were coming back with glyphosate and Flexstar early and we were doing a pretty good job. We were doing a pretty good job on, uh, on pigweed. And this is a popular treatment right now up in the Midwest for water hemp and pigweed, I found out when I gave this talk. Um, now, how many modes of action, I know I just told y'all a little bit about how to read this chart, but how many modes of action are we using in this program too? We're using 14 and nine. And I've told my guys in, in grad school, I had to know how that 14 worked inside and out. But all I want you to know is that it's a 14, <laughs> simple. And that, that glyphosate's a nine. Now, if I'm using this program in Arkansas for Palmer pigweed, how many modes of action am I using? Had to think about that one for a minute, right? I'll answer it for you. I'm using one. I'm using a 14 pre and I'm using a 14 post. If I'm putting out two shots of Ignite in a split and nothing else, I'm using a 10 twice. What got me in trouble on five million acres of Roundup Ready crops? Nine followed by nine. Do I want to go Valor followed by Flexstar on five million acres of crops? Guess what they got in the Midwest already? 14 is a PPO inhibitor. That's the name of that family of chemistry. They got PPO resisted pigweed and water hemp. They've already documented. And so my mission with my growers is to make them understand this is the first entry in our weeds control table in the MP44. We, we move the weed spectrum stuff over and we put the mode of action in there so that when they're picking out, if you look this table up in the MP44, the rest of the table is weed control. But that first line is herbicide mode of action. So what I do is I talk to them about, look, you're going to make a pre and a post. If I switch to Liberty Link and I use something like Authority MTZ, or dual prefix, which is dual and flex star, I'm doing a 15, a 14, and a 10. Three totally different modes of action for pigweed, and none of them are Roundup. Now, what are the odds of getting resistance here compared to that previous slide? 
much much less much less okay so we're making that point to our guys and it's just as easy as picking a product you still use valor or you could still use a ppo you can even use valor there's valor premixes but make sure it's got more than just a 14 in there and we're doing a pretty good job of teaching our guys about this here's a shot of that treatment we just talked about this is my research site uh, up at Newport, Arkansas, um, fondly referred to as pigweed hell by the county agents that come up and we do training with. Um, we had 40 studies, I think, up there last year that companies had put with us looking at how to kill different ways of how to kill this one weed. I think we had over 40 trials, um, including our own. And this is prefix followed by Liberty. This is one of my favorite treatments. There's a whole lot of other things that work. I mean, but, uh, and it's drill beans. Notice that. So we're cheating a little bit doing the drill beans. Greg, since you picked on me a little bit at first, um, I want you to guess the treatment. On the, left. on the left. You already got that part right. See, you're even bright. You're, you were bright back in school, too. You can guess? You assume it's what? Assume it's two shots of Roundup, yeah. You assume it's, well, most people say they assume it's a check. I like that, though, two shots of Roundup. Believe it or not, this is, this is Prowl Scepter PPI followed by Roundup. Wow. DNA, ALS, and glyphosate-resistant pigweed, all wrapped up in one. Ouch is right. Now, that severely limits your options for pigweed control when you start talking to growers about pigweed. And my reason to show this slide is to scare everybody. But the second reason is there has been no prowl or scepter used on this farm for 15 years before we came back in here and started doing this plot work. It had been turned into a cow pasture and leased out to a farmer. When we decided we needed some more land for pigweed work, we took over a field, we took a field back, worked it up, and had pigweed in it. And we put some glyphosate resistant pigweed in it to do the research on. This is after we already had it everywhere anyways. Well, come to find out it had been in beans for years back in the day, in the 80s and then whatever. And they had used a lot of prowl scepter. My point to make to the, everybody is once the chemistry is gone, you don't get it back. It doesn't come back. There's no negative selection pressure that makes it, you know, susceptible again to the ALS chemistry or to something else. That's why it's so important not to abuse Liberty and the PPO chemistry that we're using now. And that's that's what I put in there to illustrate that. Is that incorporated or is that a no to that was an incorporated, well, it wouldn't matter. It's 100% resistant. This is conventional till. So it would have been a, it would have been a, probably a PPI treatment. And it didn't, I mean, we, you know, it failed and then we didn't do anything to fix it. So it got grown up later. Um, how are we doing in Arkansas? Uh, we are, we have moved, you know, I've been, I told Don that I've been giving this talk all over the Midwest and there, there is a group of people in the room that this slide right here scares the living daylights out of. The Monsanto reps in the room hate this number right here because in Arkansas it's irrelevant. But in Ohio and Indiana, 23% is very relevant as far as market goes. So they are very interested in not having this resistance problem grow any further. And that was really surprising to me that I had the biggest impact probably on those reps uh, when I went up there and talked. We're at about 60% of our Liberty Link beans getting a residual. I'd like that to be at 100%. Um, overall, about 85% of our beans get a residual. Uh, the ones that don't are getting prefix or flex star so early that it might as well be considered a pre. It's going out extremely early. Um, you know, we had five weed scientists and all of our counties have had at least one ag agent, which has enabled us to have this system in place to, to try to get these results. And we, we've all been working really hard 
um, since 2010 to try to curb this this problem or it would have probably just took over the state people ask can you really make a difference you know it seems like it's just out the cats out of the bag and there's not much you can do to change it um, since my career started with Arkansas I didn't discover this one but I found all these under my program we have six glyphosate resistant weeds and this was from my talk in 2010 at the pig posium to the 800 growers that were there um, and I said look fellas coming soon we got barnyard grass samples we're testing we got tall water hemp it's a cousin to pigweed goose grass and broadleaf signal grasses the grasses were starting to show up this one Johnson grass population had already been found we were going down the road of, find, of just continuing to find about one every year and a half that was my schedule um, and, and that's, the, that's the road we were on but once we got this pigweed, here's our list of glyphosate resistant weeds in 2013. Guess what? It's the same list. Since guys have started doing 23% Liberty Link, since we've started using residuals, since we've started starting clean and planting narrow rows and doing all these things, we hadn't found another glyphosate resistant weed in the state. We did away, we stopped the experiment <laughs> that was, we were conducting. <coughs> so I'm convinced that you can make a difference, but it takes a statewide effort. And in our case, we were forced to. And what I've been struggling to do is get guys in Ohio, Indiana, other places, they're not really forced to yet. They're still getting by with the two shots of cheap Roundup. It's hard to convince them to put dual out or uh, to add to the program. We're paying attention to things now that we never thought about before. Uh, we got a lot of corn out there. This is a corn field in Arkansas. They're harvested in late August. Um, hey, we don't get freezes sometimes till November, December. Plenty of time for Mr. Pigweed to emerge. That's a seed head right there in an old corn field coming up post harvest in corn. So we're having to start to pay attention to things like post harvest. Um, Jason Norsworthy is looking into things to do with combine trash. I mentioned these weeds, they're spreading so rapidly, um, you know, through the combines. It's unbelievable what some of the guys over in Australia and some other places are doing in this area. And we think that within a matter of a few years, you're going to see Case and John Deere come out with equipment, combines that are, have equipment on the back of them that somehow destroy seed as it comes out the back and, and they're those Australians got it bad over there with ryegrass and they're sort of pioneering the way um, but this is some work that Norsworthy did this this little project right here with the tarp done about killed four graduate students doing that one right there this one we furred it up in a row and we burned it and that actually made a, a pretty good difference so you know we're at the point of running out of herbicide options we got to fall back on trying to outthink the weed and look at its biology and and use some of our agronomy training too just real quickly you know there are new things coming um, we got this new herbicide zidua it's in the same class of chemistry as dual which we're already using but but it is a new very good effective herbicide for pigweed and it was just introduced this year um, they've got it in combination with Valor and a product called Fierce and they'll sell out of both Zidua and Fierce this year on, for pigweed in Arkansas. Um, Dicamba 2,4-D and HPPD tolerant soybeans are on the way. Um, I've had all these in my program already and uh, they all look good on pigweed. I, you know you're going to see combinations of these come out with both glyphosate and glufosinate which is the Liberty herbicide um, so we're looking at combined traits coming out in these beans in the future um, to help provide some answers for, for some of this pigweed um, that we're having. But, you know, this one's, you know, supposedly pretty close, but all these are still regulated. So um, we're not counting on these things to save the day for a couple of years. Yes, sir. Uh, could we go back one slide, please? We are having difficulty controlling very scale with Dicamba and 240 in uh, K County. 
which is just not the data. And that's when the cause of problem when you come out with soybean with dicamba with the problems. Absolutely. We uh we have seen um, our average rate go from eight ounces of dicamba that I mentioned when we started the talk. A lot of guys have, have gone up to 12 now, and some are using combinations with 2,4-D. Um, I wouldn't say we have resistance, but we are seeing a reduction in control compared to what we used to see when we first started doing it. Um, you know, it's tough. I mean, it, it's when you get into a situation like that. But if it's resistant to it in a burn down, it's going to be resistant to it post as well. So, you know, that's an area that, uh, you know, where I cover in this state. I mean, that's something I would be up there. You know, I'd, I'd say we need to look at pre's and we need to look at tank mix partners and, and figure out how to, you know, how to work on that problem. Um, there's just a shot of glyphosate and dicamba up at Pigweed Hill um, just to prove that you know, this was a this was a regulated study we did in 2012. That's a um, actually is not dicamba. It's a combination of glyphosate and dicamba that Monsanto is looking at. Um, but as you can see, it it, it does have the the technology is promising uh, for pigweed. So these these new things are working pretty good. Um, if any of y'all are interested in the materials that we've created, um, it'll be a challenge, but you can find them on our website at uh, uaex.edu. Our weed publication is the MP44. You can search for that, and um, it's uh, you know probably my biggest responsibility from one year to the next at Arkansas has been to try to update and maintain the MP44 current with all the label changes and things that happen and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, that's, that's my primary publication where we put all of our research, all of our recommendations go into that. And with that, Don, I'll take any, any questions or criticisms. <laughs>